While the world was still coming to terms with India's success in IT services, one young man working in GE Capital decided there was something beyond that. Pramod Basin sold the idea to his employers in the US that critical processes could be done out of India. Jekis was created, went on to become a global success story, Genpact, had centers even in Dalian, China, and Pramod himself became chairman of NASCOM, was awarded by many, many people, including the President of India and the Ernst & Young Entrepreneurs Award, and today runs Clicks Capital. Pramod Basi, a wonderful entrepreneur and a great human being. I'm today with a very good friend, Pramod Basin. And Pramod, of course, uh, his reputation preceded him when I first met him. Because everybody was talking about Pramod, the finance wizard who started the whole BPO industry in India. And when I did meet him, I think it was a real pleasant surprise to meet somebody who is very down to earth, very passionate about what he does, and clearly a super success story. So Pramod, tell, me, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Pramod Basin? Oh gosh, Pramod Basin is not a remarkable human being or a great, brilliant person of any kind. I think we, I was, um, I had the good fortune of working for a company like GE, which in its heyday was one of the greatest, was the one of the greatest companies in the world, with fantastic management talent, management techniques under Jack Welch, Gary Wendt, people like that. And I learned a lot from them. Um, you know, I was a commerce graduate who had done leverage buyouts in America um, after doing my chartered accountancy in London. And so my background was very uniquely different from what I eventually ended up doing, which is Genpact and the BPO industry. But I learned, I had learned a lot from, uh, about entrepreneurialism uh, from doing leverage buyouts in America. These were the days, uh, these were the go-go days of you know, um, bonfire of the vanities and, <laughs> uh, and, and all, all kinds of crazy hostile takeovers, et cetera, which is where we cut our teeth. Uh, we were actually managing some pretty tough uh, workout deals and portfolios which G Capital had. And you learned entrepreneurship. You learned how to sell assets, what to buy, what to sell, what to build, how to... So um, you go with G Capital when the idea of Genpact came up, right? Yes. Yes. So that came about mainly once I had been sent back to India by G Capital to start G Capital in India from scratch. Which year um, was this? This was 94. I'd been sent back. And a um, couple of years into it, you know, we all thought India was great, but India was also a country where the future is bright and always will be, right? So that missing middle class that we were looking for to finance for home loans, et cetera, wasn't there. And we kept looking for them, could never find them. <laughs> and so we had an urgent need to make some money, uh, to bring in profits, to make GE Capital in India very successful. And I had the benefit of an astonishingly wonderful management team uh, at that point in time, which is one of the things GE always taught you is you hired fabulous people and we built a very formidable management. Actually, one of the records, Ganesh, I'm very proud of is four of my HR people from GE Capital are HR heads of Fortune 50 companies now in oh. the US. And I hired them, start, they started with me here and then they moved on. So we had a fantastic management team, but we weren't making enough money as most companies didn't in India. And we needed to find a different use for them. And I, that's when I thought it wasn't a brainstorm. It wasn't a, a strategic discussion. It was a, it was an idea which just came to me when I was wandering around in Chennai, I think. And I said, why can't we use these talented people to deliver services for the rest of the world? Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this must be a compelling idea because no country in the world had English speaking talent in a whole host of qualifications and backgrounds than India. So if you thought about accountants, if you thought about English speakers, BA, BA graduates, if you thought about insurance, bankers, everything, suddenly the scope opened up in front of my eyes. Um, and that was the start of the idea of 
BPO. But tell me, Pramod, I mean, at that time, I mean, people like Infosys and TCS, I think, started off in the 81 or early, early 80s. So the IT services industry was getting established. So what is the, I mean, why would you think that suddenly a business process idea would set? I didn't, um, quite honestly. Nor did we begin to realize how successful it might be. Okay. It was an idea in its basic style, which was very compelling to say, I can probably deliver these kinds of services to the rest of the world at a substantial saving of 40 to 50%. Mm. There was no question that this, that about this idea selling or not selling. In fact, the first few people I spoke to, eminent business people in India, all told me it could not work. They said telecom wouldn't work. Our people didn't know the subjects. Our people wouldn't have the discipline. We wouldn't be able to bring in the process discipline. We wouldn't be able to do 20 other things and therefore it won't work. Which is when I decided that, yes, it would work, actually. There's a streak in me which is very rebellious, as you may have seen. And that's immediately when I said, all right, this has to work. How can it not work? And I could think about having worked in the US and the UK for 25 years, which is what I did. I could compare the caliber of the people we had with anyone in the world. They were as good, except that they cost a fraction. Now, how can you leverage that basic idea is where I was coming from. And I thought, and I went to my bosses. It was a preposterous idea. You must remember, Ganesh. It was a preposterous idea. We didn't have phone lines at home, right? We all had three phone lines because two would be down. And I would call up my boss, Gary Went and G Capital and said, I have this brainwave that I can do your backend uh, financial services, finance and accounting from India. And the phone line would go down and he would, I would call him back and say, Gary, I'll call you back. I'll call you back. And I would call him back and say, look, I have this great idea. He says, how are you going to do this? I said, oh, phone lines. And he would say, you can't even talk to me. I said, it's all right. I'll solve for it. I don't know how. I was a leveraged buyout guy. You know, I'd done, at that time, I was doing consumer finance. I was doing uh, commercial finance. We were building a corporate uh, loan book, a syndication desk, private equity. Where the hell did this idea come from? I don't know. So it was preposterous, um, to be honest. And nobody was going to touch me very closely, except I had credibility. I was a senior guy at GE Capital. Um, I was an officer of GE Capital. Um, they sent me here. And so they couldn't ignore me. <laughs> I think that's the best I can say. <laughs> and I kept at them. And I said, look, please just let me try. It was because a few they minutes. Of course, to lose Pramod Basin, they gave you a little toy to play with. Correct. <laughs> That's yes. right. And I don't think anybody thought it would be. Uh, certainly, I didn't. No, so what did you start with Pramod? Was it mainly call center kind of work or was it actual transaction processing? What, what no, what we, started, we started with very simple things. So we knew a bunch of, a couple of things, Ganesh, and we rested our business on that. One, we knew we could not afford to make any errors. Because the world would blame India. And, you know, one of the CEOs I worked with later on said it very well. He said, Pramodin, if you, if you make a payment in accounts payable in America, it's a problem of the system. If you make a payment in accounts payable in India, it's a problem of India. And remember that. They will all say, you can't do this in India, as opposed to saying it was a minor hiccup. So one, we knew it had to be foolproof. Two, we knew we had to do it at great speed, and with great cost efficiency. So we started with something that we felt, and we, I went to one of my friends in, within GE Capital who was running the largest retailer credit card, private label credit card business. We went to him and said, why don't you give us your white mail? And white mail is the mail that comes in from as correspondence with address changes. And in those days, you didn't have the internet, you didn't have online stuff. You had none of that. You didn't have mobile phones, uh, by the way. Um, and you said we got requests from customers. They would bundle these requests in, in, in a full batch and courier them to us. And we would input them into the database and we would send them back. So a lot of our time was spent on, and we would triple check them. So we said, we're not going to double check. We will triple check everything because we will provide a 100% certainty. Now, I didn't tell my US counterparts this, 
they just thought we were brilliant. Look at our guys. It was so good. I said, yeah, right. You know, <laughs> till I get this right, I'm not going to uh, take any chance of uh, making mistakes. And then we started using that. And so people didn't like that initially. We liked it. We thought, wow, my God, what a success. It also took the phone lines out of play because I didn't have to rely on very defective phone lines, which is what India had in those days. And the telecom policy was just opening up. And that's when we realized that, okay, we can do more. We can do the call center stuff, which is where, you know, Raman came in. We hired Raman and he helped with STPI figure out how to get a domestic call center connect. But that was honestly not the biggest. The biggest it, element. It was which year when you and Raman started this call center part? 96, 97. Okay. 96, 97, really. Well, 97, really. And we, I think we started all the work in 98, 97, 98. But I think the call center wasn't the biggest piece for us. The biggest piece was clearly finance and accounting. Um, and there was a science we had to build up, Ganesh, which I loved doing. So you had to build up transition toolkits, as they call them, as you know, because every process is informal and formal. So you had to go understand it, build a science. You had to find a way to manage on the entire operation. So you did, you used Six Sigma, you used all of those things. You had to train people in subjects they'd never heard of before. You know, mortgage processing, auto insurance, credit cards, because most people didn't have credit cards. So we were doing all of that and then coping with the wonderful world of Gurgaon and Haryana. Our first office is still on the highway, worth going to see. It's historic. Um, it's a shed. It's a warehouse. None of these fancy buildings existed. We could get no food, no uh, transportation, nothing. Didn't know how to get people there. Didn't know how to get them home. Um, every step, every morning was a new event. Every day was a new problem. Um, and I knew that in the, me in the meantime, um, you know, GE was waiting to see you. They hadn't given me a lot of money, nor do I think they put a lot of hopes behind this. But I knew that if we killed it really well in the up early stages with flawless execution and outstanding hiring. So the element that helped us was we hired fabulous people, showcased them to our counterparts in the US, and they looked at them and looked at the salaries we could pay. You know, a chartered accountant in India, you could hire in those days for four or five lakhs, three or four lakhs, whatever the number is. Unimaginable to be able to hire a CPA equivalent. And so that blew people away at that point in time. And we started expanding that canvas. But you know, even at the best of time, I remember hiring Tiger Thiagaraj, who currently runs Genpak, bringing him in to when, when, when Raman moved on to say, Tiger, uh, I, I want you to run this business because one day we will be 2,000 people strong. That's how big we're going to be here. <laughs> and he was saying, he's saying, wow, yes, that's fantastic. <laughs> Let's come in and do it. But the audacity of it, I think, Ganesh, is something I do think about a lot, which is to say, go to a country 5,000 miles away, go to a company and say, over to faulty telecom lines, I'm going to do your back-end accounting and finance um, out of, uh, out of uh, India. Uh, and these are mission cr critical processes. Um, try that with anybody. I've asked a lot of people. I said, why don't we try that with some other country and see how fast they throw us out? So it was. <laughs> Let me ask you to put on an immodest Punjabi hat and say how much of it was due to promote Basit. <laughs> you know, in the convincing piece and the passion piece, it was, I, I, it, it, it Within GE and GE Capital, I, I was carrying that conviction. I knew them well. I was an officer of GE by then. I was running GE Capital Asia also. Uh, so I had the power to go in there and convince them and talk to people with credibility. And I think that helped a lot because you need a ready buyer at the other end. Otherwise, most people wouldn't let you do this. And they were able to look at us and say, all right, we believe you, Paul. We believe you'll deliver all of it. that mattered a huge deal. Having said that, we put together Ganesha fabulous team. This was a hallmark of G. We put together great organizations. It's still a great organization. 
And they were able to help solve for all the pieces that went into it. But yes, the dream was entirely mine. Um, the idea was entirely mine. And very importantly, as we kept moving forward, I realized I could keep expanding the scope of what we could do to a point where we started telling everybody, don't ask, ask us what we, can, what we can do, ask us what we can't do. Because within a company, I can do supply chain, I can do actuarial, I can do insurance, I can do lit, uh, treasury management. So in time, very quickly, Ganesh, we were doing, the BPO industry got known for call centers. We weren't doing that much call center. Of course, it takes a lot of people, but we were doing treasury management for all of Europe, GE European treasury. We started the analytics business in 1999, 2000. Uh, we started actuary. We actually had actuaries sitting in our offices doing actual work for the US. We did medical claims underwriting, you know, very large medical claims underwriting out of here. So we were beginning to really touch. At one time, I remember we even experimented with, um, you know, doing French work out of India with the cast of people who spoke French. And then, of course, we took this to China. So one of my things that I'm very proud of is actually we globalized this movement, Ganesh. Um, we were the ones who went to Dalian first because the head of GE said, why don't we, we have Japanese speaking Chinese here. Can we do it for Japan? Um, and really started that. No, Dalian hadn't seen a bunch of Indians before. They would follow me down the street to see where I was going and who I was. <laughs> and it was pioneering work. So that was the fantastic joy. I think you've probably done more to evangelize China than Xi Jinping has done, right? I doubt that, but certainly Dalian, we put placed it on the map. We were the first guys there. Uh, Accenture followed everybody else. But to be honest, Ganesh, that to that extent, we were pioneers in India. We were casting new ground, thinking about how do you plan, how do you hire, the the entire hire hiring mechanism that we put in, the operations that we put in, the, going to new cities, Jaipur, Hyderabad, um, taking that kind of chance to. And these are, in hindsight, very easy, but in those days, very hard because you're saying, all right, we're going to go to the airport, Jep, Hyderabad, and we will find the talent we need. And what if you don't find the talent you need? And then how much training does that take? And all of those things had to be, were risks that we took. But is there some part of, I mean, the famous G, Six Sigma, and process maturity. So were processes also a very important part of your success in general? Completely. Completely. So... We had to find a way to manage this entire operation. And at that time, GE had announced introducing Six Sigma into the organization across the board. So I clung on to that as my raison d'etre. The amazing thing, Ganesh, in this work is the science of business processes has never been written, right? So if you want to make a paper clip, there is a def refined, defined way in which you make it, engineering-wise, manufacturing-wise. Processes, everybody pays bills differently. Everybody pays a mortgage differently. Every bank processes a mortgage differently. So none of that had been written. So we needed a framework to build what I would call, used to call the science of managing business processes. And we helped build that. We helped create that. So we helped build what we said was the ideal, most optimistic, best, most efficient mortgage process from a bank, for instance. And we use that fairly pioneering work in terms of process management, but it was resting on the foundations of not just Six Sigma, but Lean. So the other thing we did, Ganesh, was we took a huge plunge in many of these areas. Um, it all sounds terribly easy. Uh, we train, you know, we, at one time, I remember we had something like um, 16,000 people trained in Greenbelt Six Sigma, you know, um, or 16,000 people trained in Lean. We would have something like 6,000 people trained in six, Greenbelt Six Sigma. So we really invested heavily into the science of managing business processes. When, when did the whole industry start? sprouting around you? I mean, there was Dutch and Spectramind and WNS, etc. So was, did you have a two, three year lead time before all that began to happen? Oh, yes. Well, we were a captive. 
and GE didn't want to stop do this commercially. So okay. I had every major company, including Accenture, come through our doorsteps and say, will you do this for us? And we said, no. Oh, okay. Can you imagine if we had said yes to Accenture and said we would do this for them? And <laughs> GE that way, and that's one thing, if I may say, GE at one time at 20% of the business of DCS, Satyam, all of these companies. Can you imagine? I, and I used to push GE very hard and say, Guys, build an industry out of this. You know, you're lo lose, leaving enormous value on the table. And they didn't. And they didn't. And they missed the boat. And look at the valuation. I mean, TCS is now valued more than GE. So that gives you an idea. <laughs> but having said that, um, I think GE didn't want to be doing this commercially. There were issues around it, which were around the whole John Kerry thing had popped up at that time about outsourcing. So, gee, this is not, and, and Jack Welch hated headcount. So, the one thing he didn't love about me was I was adding headcount, you know, by sort of a thousand a month. <laughs> and it was anathema to GE because they relied so much on efficiency. Um, and so, they didn't want to be known for outsourcing. And at that point in time, we stayed a captive, even though Standard Chartered, Bank of America, everybody walked through our offices. And had we been able to do it for them, I think we would have, Jetpack would be three times its size. And, and also they would not have set up their own. They, that's the point, right? Both, exactly, as you said. They wouldn't have set up their own and they would, we would be three times the size. So, um, but anyway, that's, that's life. That's the way it works. Which was the first true third-party outsourcing company that came in, I mean, who were doing work for multiple companies? Um, at that time, it became Daksh. Okay. came out. Well, what happened was then suddenly we were getting a flood of queries of people wanting to come into the office and see what we were doing. From the McKinsey's to the Standard Charters to people everywhere. And they started writing to Welch about what a great thing. it is. So Welch actually shut down all visits. He said, I don't want more people writing to me about this. <laughs> and they really didn't realize till the end, Ganesh, that they had a tiger by the tail. I did by then. I, I realized, I said, my God, this is spectacular. This is something special. They didn't. They just thought it's a back office, right? And I said, no, this is a new industry being born. Um, and that difference is subtle, but enormous, as you can imagine, right? To say this is a new industry being born. And by the way, uh, there's a large myth that runs around that, like GE had this idea, GE was born. Absolutely not. GE did not have this idea. I was selling within GE night and day to get them not to jettison the idea <laughs> and let it happen. And then even when it was happening, it was like, don't tell me about it. Okay. Don't tell me that you're adding 10,000 people a year about it. So, but then um, as you said, you really, you really got the tiger by the tail, tiger Tyagaraja. So when did yeah, you tiger, Well, I had him, but we also had the real tiger by the tail, which was, you know, this, we had hordes of people wanting business. And so we went to GE eventually and said, guys, spin us off. Because in the meantime, exactly as you said, McKinsey started its own operations, the McKinsey uh, Knowledge Center, uh, Bank of America came in, Standard Chartered came in, Accenture came, very important, IBM came. And all of them started using this and realizing this is a massive one. And that's when the business started flowing. So when, so when we went- When did you get permission to start doing outside GE work? Only when we were able to spin off. They weren't okay. allowing me to do any, which was 1994. Uh, no. 2004, what am I saying? 2000. 2004. And in 2004, I went to GE in 2003 and four and said, guys, our growth is slowing down enormously. Uh, we will never be able to grow much. You will lose all the people. This company, this business has value, spin it off. Uh, and fortunately, Jeff Melt at that time agreed and said, all right, uh, let you spin it off. We'll keep 40%, 60% goes to private equity. And this was 2000, January 1, 2005, we became an independent company called Genpact. Um, and that's when we first, the first customer, uh, if I may, was Carlos Ghosn of Nissan, you know, um, who I remember very fondly because it was a fastest uh, win that we've had, which is I sat in opposite, opposite him in a hotel room in the Mumbai Oberoi. And he asked me, what do you do? I said, we do back-end processes. 
Um, I'd ask someone in GE to set it up. So what kind of process? I told him, what, what is the result? I said, I'll, I'll deliver 40% saving. He says, you do this for GE? I said, yes. He said, they're tough taskmasters. I said, absolutely. If we can do it for them, we can do it for anyone. And he gave me the contract. And he said, okay, sold. That, that, speaks, was that speaks volumes for your sales capability because Carlos Gone was my favorite case study in Harvard Business School. And he must have been one hell of a tough nut to crack. So. Ooh, he was tough, but he was direct, very clear. I think the, the robustness that we got from serving a client like GE, who is internal, but ultimately extraordinarily demanding, extraordinarily disciplined, was invaluable. In fact, by the way, GE is the one who helped a lot of companies like TCS, et cetera, also do project management and learn how to do those things. I remember getting up in an annual meeting um, of GE and saying, you know, guys, I love you, but I'd rather go for a medical examination with significant invasive procedures than deal with you guys. <laughs> I remember standing up in a hall of 500 people saying that and everybody laughed because they all knew that was 100% true. Dealing with G was very tough. Ask Narayan Murthy, he'll tell you. <laughs> I will. Okay. <laughs> he didn't okay, like them. Okay, let's move on from what to the industry. So, I mean, now, now just fast forward, next, next 15 years, 2005 to 2021. Yes. How has the industry grown in terms of width and depth and volume? What, what, yes. Just give us a story. Sure. Uh, one other story though, in, in, before that. I think, again, it's taken for granted. But to go from being a captive to serving the rest of the world, even if the idea is yours and brand new, takes a lot of doing. And a lot of my best competitors, WNS, et cetera, et cetera, said, and this is Punjabi Basin coming out a little bit, please. So come to the table and you'll suddenly realize what the real world is like. And I said, well, I've run the real world financial services businesses all my life. We'll see. Uh, so we spun off. By the way, we lost every single contract we were bidding for, or almost every single contract we were bidding for in the first six months, because we didn't know how to bid. We didn't know what a contract was. We didn't know any of the nuances of this industry that had been constructed by there. But by that December, we won every major finance contract that we bid for. Pfizer, Cadbury's, one after the other, we won them all. And that's when we really came up. We grew, uh, Ganesh, in the first five years, our global clients, not GE, grew at 99% a year, average annual growth rate for five years. Wow, that's and, amazing. And we took off and we left Daksh and WNS and EXL way behind at that point in time. You know, they were, um, I went from 400 million to 800 million in three years in revenues. And they had gone from, you know, 100 to 200 to 300 million. And we just absolutely cream there. and we kept, kept growing like that so i'm very proud of what we did as a business and as a management team because our growth was spectacular we went public you know we spun off in 2005 and we went public in 2007 on the new york stock exchange um, you know we spun off at 600 million dollars and we went public at 3.2 billion so it was a remarkable period of time but to your broader question of the industry and where it's gone. I have pluses and minuses on that. So I think one, it's expanded wonderfully well with a lot of um, great value add services in analytics, um, in research in terms of financial analysis, things like that that are happening, which are cutting edge, which are really showing the way um, you know, higher end services can be delivered out of India. Having said that, I don't think our industry has evolved the way it could have. We should be making products. So what kind of products? Very simple. Just like ADP has a payroll, we should have an accounts payable product. We should have a, a finance and accounting product. We should have products where people come in and use our box and are delivered an output and a service. And we just haven't evolved to that level, which I feel sad about. We've all globalized. So every is, major- is it, is it because of easier pickings and services and just the, too much of a hassle to make products? I mean, which is probably true for the IT sector as well. It's certainly some level of easier picking, but I also believe honestly, Ganesh, it's lack of risk taking. Mm. People aren't taking the risk, whereas, if you look at margins and the companies that make 
terrific margins. They make these kinds of products. Now for us to bundle them together, try and sell them would have been a magnificent idea. And it is something I, I tried when I was there and had I stayed, I would have done it. I'm, I'm very sure I wouldn't have let it go. But I don't think we invested the time, money, energy into saying, how do I build a accounts payable product? How do I build a mortgage product? How do I build an insurance product? Why shouldn't every bank in the world uh, you know, process its mortgages through a product that we build or a platform that we build? Just think about that, right? Um, we're still doing, okay, you have, you, how many people do you need? You need 10? Okay, I'll give you 10. We're still at that phase. We're not saying, give me what you want done and I'll do it for you at a 99 point, like a bank, you know? They take our money and then they give it back to us when we want it. And we don't crawl through the undergrowth to see who's doing it and how they're doing it or a payroll company or so many other service companies. So I think that is one area where I wish <clears throat> we would solve for it. Two, one thing we tried very hard at GenPack, which again, I hope the IT guys also do is try to be better than our customers at what we were doing become the experts in that area. And I wonder to what extent we have achieved that because we should be the experts. You know, We should be best in class at whatever we're doing because that's our business. And yet I wonder if we have moved far enough away from being order takers to being designers. But I keep hearing from a lot of CEOs today that, look, I mean, we've moved beyond outsourcing to optimization. We're able to add value back to the customer by just telling them how to do it better. So is that really happening to in, or is it more anecdotal? No, it's huge. I think that part is huge. So when, but, but by the way, to be honest with you, we started that with Six Sigma. One of the reasons to embed Six Sigma in our operations was because we could offer our clients product and we want most of our contracts based on that, by the way all of them, because we would say, these are the people who will deliver Six Sigma efficiency, lean efficiencies to you every single day. But you know, that's still, yes, using a defined process. It isn't transforming it. It isn't changing it completely and saying, throw that out, plug into our platform, and I'll do it for you for a lot of money, but a 10th of the cost for myself and much lower cost for you. So we also lost the advantage there, Ganesh, and I blame myself and the IT industry. The moment you start pricing for per person, you're dead. Your productivity goes out of the window, you don't get paid enough, et cetera. Look at the margins Cisco makes, look at the margins Microsoft. That's what you make on products, right? You make 40, 50%, Cisco makes, I think 40% operating margin. It's ridiculous. <laughs> But you lose that because you're pricing per person. The moment you're pricing per person, you will manage per person. But that is a malaise that pervades the entire industry. So, I mean, the reason why I, mean, I, I talk about the 190, 200 billion dollar industry, but it's still hardly 10 billion is products and one or two very significant companies like Zoho. So what do you think goes wrong? I mean, do we not have the staying power? I mean, I'm talking about the overall industry, not just BPM. So is that a problem or is it just that, as I was saying earlier, easy pickings of services? It's a real problem. I don't think we understand how to do that, nor have we taken the risks to find out. I really believe that. I think we all have these ideas. I would like to build an accounts payable factory. For instance, could I build a great product to optimize and maximize working capital for companies based on platforms? based on input of inventory and receivables and payables? Would I have the knowledge of all the companies that I work with in my backyard to accumulate that data and be able to do? Of course, I have it. And I, so I wish we would do it. Do we have the knowledge in the IT companies to look at all the work they're doing on operating centers and the application development that they're doing for various applications to optimize that so that you can really take a product to companies and say, just come on guys, do it on the cloud? Did we have to wait for everybody else to go onto the cloud? Why couldn't we be as big as them? So I think a lot of it is just, we don't go to market that way. We don't think about life that way. We don't think about margins that way. And we don't make the investment that we need in people partially because 
we're doing very well. But partially also because I really believe we're not as hungry as I think we should be. Or is it also because the availability of English-speaking, reasonably good manpower is a, is a benefit, obviously. Out of the 50 lakh people, the whole industry employs probably close to 20 lakh work for EPM companies. Whereas in Israel could never find that kind of talent. So it, it goes out and builds products and there's so many companies on the NASDAQ. So sometimes the abundance we have itself the limitation of our own thinking. Ganesh, it's a very important point you're making as to what is the model you get framed into. But you know, our big companies like Genpact are now truly global. Correct. They're international. They're everywhere. So I don't think we can sit back and rest on that and say, okay, um, you know, we're still um, sort of, we're still embedded in finding in, in labor arbitrage kind of stuff. You have to at some point say you've got a collected, you've got a collection of experience, data, information, customers. What else can you do with that? And I think that part, if you look at Oracle, look at SAP, look at how much they charge for installation. Look at how much they're worth, how much is the margins with and market cap to me is not what is important. So TCS has a fabulous market cap today, right? But it has more than Accenture. But Okay, I, it's not that, to me, the, the most impressive thing. The thing is, in terms of margins and, and profits and revenue growth, how well do we do? And mm. in the past, we used to do very well, but I, I think we could do much better. And I wish we would try. So Pramod, if you look at the industry today, from your vantage position, you've kind of been there, done that. And there are many, many millions of young people who are still looking at this industry with stars in their eyes, what would you, I mean, if you were talking to a 24 year old, what would you point her to? I mean, what, what's the area they should choose? I mean, within the larger India, because you, you know every sector and then within the IT sector, is there something specific that you think are the opportunities of the future? Ganesh, the opportunity in our industry itself that we're talking about, the BPO industry is massive. If you think about healthcare and its needs, if you think about analytics and the things you could do there on retail, et cetera, if you think about higher end retailing, insurance, banking, we haven't begun to scratch the surface of what we could do. I think it will take, we cannot just go back to the customers and say, okay, take 20 people out and I'll do this and I'll supply to 20 people. These companies are spending massively on technology and design and solutions. We have a massive opportunity to provide solutions to all of them, which they will embrace, which are inevitably going to be a combination of design, digitization, technology, analytics, judgment, process expertise. So I think the opportunity to build and make India, what I would have loved to see, and I used to talk about it when I was running Genpac, is India should be the services factory for the world, completely. And I fear, and we have the talent, and we have the money now, but I fear we haven't demonstrated that we have the ambition. If you go to China, you know, they're the manufacturing capital of the world, right? And in software, they're already internally building out more software than we have, by the way. They use it. I just wish we had the guts to take that on and say, all right, we will build 40 Zohos, right? We will build, and we will put the money behind into marketing, product development, getting market share, et cetera. And I'm afraid that hasn't happened. Two, the top layer of companies is still uh, the same narrow band, if you think about it. And surely by now we should have had another 30. But tell me one thing, Pramod. I mean, you have massive international experience. And in fact, for the last six months, six of us have been working on a policy paper on how the asymmetry between India and China can be addressed. And hopefully over the next maybe 20 years of 8% growth in India and maybe 5% growth in China, we can come closer. 
but do you believe that you know that we've not really focused on higher education and innovation and you know areas like ai to the extent that china has done and is there a lot of catching up to do i think china is so far ahead in some areas that they are 10 years ahead of america in ai i i don't know that people realize that till you go there and see what they've done in digital health drone manufacturing artificial intelligence in a whole wide variety of areas the way they are using machine learning all the time now they i i would tell you they they have four times the artificial engineers of anywhere else in the world right so in that they are but you know we have some inherent strengths ganesh that as a culture we have to take more risks the chinese take risks they're ambitious like the israelis like the americans the americans take a lot of risk right i mean it is an american company that said all right we don't believe you this is a preposterous idea here's 2 million dollars try it. right so if you think about it that way now we have our leaders our hcls our infosys our tcss of fantastic pioneers who went out and carved new paths um amazingly well i wonder though if there are enough of them today or are we a little too comfortable um because we're not producing new things and i wish we would you know tiktok comes out of china by god tiktok should be here right um all of these things should be here so i think in that question in that era we have to <clears throat> are we behind in education oh yes by 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 decades should that stop us from producing 50 more companies because we still have a massive pool by any standard of highly educated people um do we take risks no it's the one thing ge taught me was and that's why gen pact was formed otherwise i could have never built it it's you take is to take risks and try something new so pramod final question to you you are still a very young man so why don't you why don't you plunge in and create the industry wave 3.0 rather than going back to finance <laughs> no i would love to in fact i've been thinking about it. so right now i just came off a conversation um today with some ex colleagues in europe saying if we collect analytical data if we collect data from a variety of different companies and start assimilating them what could we do with it and how could we build a business with it so this is exactly what i would love to do start another five companies embedded in this kind of thinking which build real products so imagine aganesh for instance and this is the difference these are ex colleagues of mine i start with the premise of i've got great minds great people and i can deploy them for the use of other companies all of them are europeans they all come from factories no we make a product then we sell the product immediately right because that's where they come from that's where i come from and therein lies the difference and therein lies the marriage that i hope one day we can all make but i think we have to take more risks as a country we have to be willing to stand up and say you know why can't we build another 20 tcss the world has world has enough room to spend um and allow this to happen why can't we in europe why can't we go to china and do more work there in europe we're very small if you think about it there are a lot of european companies but we're global companies and we have to learn to take that on latin america all of latin america you know and and i hear this a lot from companies which say um well we're not well latin america is different etc but if you think of city bank it's everywhere it's everywhere if you think about hsbc if you think about healthcare companies if you think about pfizer if you think these companies are everywhere they're in latin america as much as they are in asia why aren't we to the same scale what you're saying pramod is that i mean we've done well and we can be proud of what we've achieved in it bpm and everything else but the future is immensely possible and we can we probably shouldn't rest on our laurels and really go forward and make great things happen 
Yes, and I, I, it's very, that's very aptly put. I think we've done extraordinarily well. I fear that that success, as you have pointed out, should not make us complacent. And I wish we were far more ambitious and global in our scale, not just saying we'll be in India and we'll work out of India, but truly global and say, we will, if you want to be in the BPO business, why am I not the best around the world, not just America and India or what happened to the rest of the world? We can't, we should go there. Dave, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Pramod. On that note, thanks. I think as always, very exciting conversation. And we hope that if not you, somebody else will make all your dreams come. Oh, they must. <laughs> <laughs> I would be so happy. <laughs> thanks, Th Thank you, Ganesh. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank sir. You, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.